Welcome everyone. I see people are joining. Um, we will give it a couple minutes to allow those that have registered to join. So a couple minutes here before we begin our session today. For those that have just joined, um, we'll wait another minute before we get started. There's others joining in. All right, well, I will go ahead um, and we'll get started with um, our second session of our quarter one engagement days. Thank you for all of those who have joined. I know we'll have others joining us as the time goes here. Um, one housekeeping thing to mention, this is being recorded. We will make the recording available after um, in some forum, which we can share out. And also during today's webinar, please use the question and answer feature. We have some time set aside at the end, um, towards the end of the hour today, where we'll best engage and answer questions. So please use the question and answer feature here within Zoom. The chat feature has been disabled. So unfortunately, um, questions or things cannot be submitted there. So please, again, the question and answer feature. Um, and with that, we will go ahead and begin our presentation and the content for today. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, our agenda today, we've got um, a couple key and exciting topics related to our climate solutions portfolio. First, we'll do a quick introduction and context setting for the Apparel Impact Institute. We'll talk about an overview of some new and exciting bodies of work, specifically our roadmaps that were part of the second round of grant um, application processes that we've launched. And then last but not least, talk about some key milestones and dates for our climate solutions portfolio. And as I mentioned, rounding out the question and answer session of today's webinar. Next slide. Um, and for those of you on the webinar who don't know me, my name is Brian Slapre. I'm the Senior Director of Industry Engagement here at the Apparel Impact Institute, responsible for leading the team and have the privilege of working with some wonderful individuals on our industry engagement globally, and specifically managing all of our brand, supplier, and stakeholder partnerships. And then, Pauline, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Pauline Optebeck and I'm the Environmental Portfolio Lead for AI, meaning that I uh, lead all of the work that we do on the Climate Solutions Portfolio. So looking forward to sharing more on that with you all today. Thanks, Pauline. And we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And as I mentioned, I'll use um, the first part of today's session to talk about the Apparel Impact Institute and a little bit um, about the Climate Solutions Portfolio and Fashion Climate Fund. So as you can see, um, the Apparel Impact Institute is an organization that deploys solutions to help support decarbonization for the apparel and footwear sector. Specifically, the Apparel Impact Institute is a registered US-based not-for-profit organization that operates globally with the goal and mission to identify, fund, and scale um, proven solutions that drive decarbonization solutions for the industry. And on the screen in the, the right side of the slide here, what you'll see is the positioning of the Apparel Impact Institute in the center with two specific um, solutions work that we're able to take forward for the industry. First, our climate solutions portfolio, and second, our fashion climate fund. 
But as I mentioned, this requires us to sort of have input, engagement, and support from several other stakeholders across the industry to be able to make this progress and the work necessary for the industry around the topic of climate change possible. So first, this requires our brand and retail partners. Second, it requires qualified implementation programs and partners, specifically those who are technical experts or engineers in the regions that we operate philanthropic partners and donors to help contribute funding towards this important and necessary work. And then last in the visual here, you'll see manufacturers and suppliers who are absolutely critical to the success of this work at the facility level. A lot of these solutions and opportunities exist at the production level. And so this requires effective collaboration, listening to each of these key stakeholders, um, identifying their needs and ensuring that we're able to work together in facilitating the necessary progress for the industry. On the bottom of this visual, the last part you'll see with the dotted lines around them are other stakeholders who are secondary and important to the work, but not those that the Apparel Impact Institute necessarily directly engages with. We have partner organizations that we work with who help drive some of this work forward, specifically um, the partnership with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition as it relates to some of the policy work with consumers and communities as well. And communities we know are important to this. We each live and operate and work um, in these important communities that this work takes place in. So as a convener, we can align and bring all of this work together um, to be able to drive these urgent um, actions and and outcomes necessary to achieve the impact for climate change. Um, next slide, Pauline. Really what we wanted to focus on with this slide here is there's a lot of information, but the important part is just to show the evolution of how AI's history has evolved and sort of where we've started. On the far left in 2007, you'll see a note that references the Clean by Design program, which is a program that is owned and run by the Apparel Impact Institute, formerly managed by the Natural Resources Defense Council, where it was developed. If we fast forward into the middle here, the key milestone of 2017, when the Apparel Impact Institute was formed um, by, by and with support from the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, IDH, NRDC, and a few of our key and important member brands, Target, Gap, and PBH. Um, and then currently, if we jump ahead to 2022, an important milestone was the launch of our Fashion Climate Fund in relationship to the Fashion Climate Fund as our climate solutions portfolio, which is context for today's session. And so the $250 million Fashion Climate Fund, I will talk a little bit, a little bit more about that here um, moment to the next slide. So what's important about the work and the methodology that the Apparel Impact Institute takes forward is this journey for collective action towards factory decarbonization. And it's a five-step process and each of these steps in the process are important, but can happen at different points in time based on where either a particular brand or facility is at within their journey. And so the first part of this work is looking at a benchmark. So step one is benchmarking which leverages the Carbon Tech Assessment Tool. It's an Excel-based tool that asks several questions and allows us to identify the reduction potentials, as well as what we're calling the type, type one, two, or three uh, facility, which recognizes where that facility is at in their journey and what efforts they've done thus far to identify what are immediate and important next steps that they can consider for their journey. And the value of the benchmarking of work is for our brand partners to allow for segmentation. And we've worked with several brand partners where we've done several carbon tech assessments. So for example, we say we've done 50 carbon tech assessments. That allows that brand partner then to look at the results of all 50 and prioritize and identify where amongst those 50 they want to start in terms of, okay, let's take the top five who have the greatest reduction potentials to help improve um, our supply chain for achieving reductions. That is where we see the value of the benchmarking. Within step two, the carbon target setting module, this is where we have our carbon target setting workbook in addition to a um, SCAP, which is a supply chain climate action plan specifically for helping facilities set three to five year action plans, specific reduction targets um, to achieve that in addition to a baseline. And so that's really a three to five year holistic plan 
looking across their operations to identify how best to achieve a certain reduction threshold over that three to five year period of time. Once that target's been set, we go into implementation, which is also an important aspect to this work. Having a goal, an action plan, and reduction target are important, but taking the necessary steps to implement items from the action plan are important. And so you'll see listed below within step three here, several different programs. One I've previously mentioned, Clean by Design. We have another one called RETI. This is a Renewable Energy Transition Initiative. We have um, production waste management. And then in addition to some exciting topics we'll talk about today is our climate solutions portfolio, which is where we're making available several different initiatives or solutions to the industry um, to provide quantified and qual qualified reduction measures and improvements for facilities that participate. And the last part here, step four, before I talk about step five, is an important aspect to the work as well. So it's all about carbon target monitoring and measuring progress on a quarterly basis to ensure that there's improvements in actions being taken. And if there's barriers, understanding and helping that facility work through what are those barriers, what resources or support might they need, how can we look at the necessary improvements over a three to five year horizon on a quarterly basis and comparing that to data that we're able to collect. In the last step, which you'll see here in the concept or the development phase, is that third-party data validation. And the reason that this is still in concept phase is because the action plans developed, again, in step two, exist over a three to five year period. And with that time horizon, we won't validate until three to five years after, or sort of when that action plan is completed in three to five years. And so because the program um, entered within 20 late 21, early 22, a lot of those facilities that are currently in the implementation phase work have not completed their full action plans. And so therefore, there isn't a completed workbook or reduction target for us to validate, hence why this is showing up in the concept phase, but important for the work in actions that we as an organization will be taking forward. The next slide, Pauline. And then last, I will cover what I briefly mentioned. So as a part of this work in 2022, the Apparel Impact Institute launched our $250 million Fashion Climate Fund. So the Fashion Climate Fund is designed to unlock $2 billion of capital to help support reductions across the industry by 2030. For those of you who were on this morning's session, I had a little bit different visual um, displayed here. But the way to think about this is if there was a circle in this a circle in the center of the slide, um, it would, that would be the $2 billion unlock. On the left side, we would have a visual of $250 million, which is a fashion climate fund. That $250 million is a combination of $150 million from industry, so brands and retailers, and $100 million from philanthropy to aggregate $250 million. That money is then deployed into the supply chain, either through our grant mechanism, which Pauline will cover for us today, or into brand specific programming for facility nominations, facility sponsorship, and helping their direct suppliers make improvements in several of the programs that are run and managed by the Apparel Impact Institute. On the right side of this visual though, so if it's a $2 billion unlock, 250 million, leaves about 1.75 billion unallocated or unaccounted for. What's important is, is we are calling this our sustainable and blended capital solution. So acknowledgement that about 150 million typically will come from those suppliers and their direct participation in the work with another 1.5 or 1.6 billion then coming from traditional markets. And that's what's important here is that traditional markets exist, whether it's um, lenders, banks, impact investors, all sort of having a role to play in this work, especially as we think about climate change, necessary interventions, whether it's efficiency, renewables, thermal, all important aspects to the work that we're doing require potential investments. So what the Apparel Impact Institute is taking forward right now is an idea on blended capital and developing some specific pilots and tests on ways that we can unlock financing and su support for suppliers in the space at um, lower risk tolerances for maybe some of the lenders or the banks. And so I'm excited to share that in the next couple months and probably in our next engagement days for quarter two, we'll have a lot more to share on kind of what we've developed, where we see this work going and how this comes into be. 
And so if we take this now a step further, if that's the Fashion Climate Fund, $250 million, not talking specifically about the $1.75 billion on the sustainable finance side, look at this grant mechanism and try to identify solutions to deploy again within the supply chain. We then look at providing grants to solutions of necessary, whether it's a pre-seed pilot model or scale. There's different thresholds that we look at because each solution has different opportunities, different potential nuances, and different needs to be able to drive the necessary progress for the industry. And then last but not least, we want to be able to connect this in again to that sustainable blended finance, all the while making this data and information transparent, visible, and accessible for the industry so that we can best drive the progress and demonstrate the pathway towards 2030. So with that, I am going to close my remarks. And Pauline, if there's anything you might want to pick up on this slide or as you transition to the next, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Brian. So onto the climate solutions portfolio then. This has been created to essentially focus the industry into vetted, proven climate solutions that we can take forward, and importantly, that we can take forward in the lead up to 2030. So what we're aiming to do is, broadly speaking, to answer uh, three questions. What solutions exist to reduce emissions? I think that that uh, maybe we know a little bit more about. But of those solutions, which ones are actually credible and verifiable? And this is where the, the funnel essentially takes place because there are a lot of solutions, but not all of them uh, kind of have the data to back it up or indeed the ability to, to demonstrate that impact on an ongoing basis. And then thirdly, of those solutions, which ones do we then prioritize? And that's, again, where this kind of lens of 2030 really comes in. What can we scale between now and then? And the vision then, once we've answered those questions, is to create a marketplace, a registry for the sector. And what that registry will do is create a prioritization framework so that we can demonstrate to the industry what the most promising project solutions, technologies, programs are across the textile value chain. And we will do that in uh, two ways broadly. So on the one hand, we do have the ability to deploy grants and that comes from the Fashion Climate Fund that Brian spoke about. And those grants can be 50 to $250,000 per year of a project. And those grants will be uh, prioritized for solutions or projects, programs that need some financial support in order to unlock uh, some type of industry problem, to solve a barrier, to overcome whatever is preventing them from scaling. The other side of the climate solutions portfolio will be for solutions who are already mature, so those who do not need grant funding, but who would benefit from being vetted by AII and uh, essentially being on this climate solutions portfolio as a vetted solution that is proven to reduce emissions. So this then becomes a public resource for brands, facilities, the investor community as a one-stop shop, so to speak, of all of the climate solutions that are ready to be deployed at scale by 2030. And we aim to then facilitate the matchmaking between facilities, brands, solutions, um, uh, the, the financial sector, and importantly, then also support in the funding of, of those solutions as well, um, as outlined by Bryant through our, our blended capital strategy. And a lot of these solutions will match up to the programs that Bryant presented as well. So the technologies might feed into the recommendations that we make as part of Clean by Design. They might come from a carbon tech assessment. So because of where we are positioned in the market, we believe that by creating this uh, this portfolio of solutions, we're also able to, to kind of scale their deployment as well. So that's the ultimate vision of the climate solutions portfolio. And today in particular, we will be talking about the kind of um, grant making side of things. Um, but before we, we kind of go into the future and what we're doing this year, I just wanted to give a little overview of what we have done so far. So this was all launched. So the Fashion Climate Fund and the Climate Solutions Portfolio was launched towards the end of 2022. Um, and in the beginning of 2023, the uh, Climate Solutions Portfolio Advisory Council was formed. The purpose of that council is to evaluate grant applications, to also evaluate 
the um, kind of mature solutions who are applying to be on the registry and to make sure that we have a perspective across the industry. So from brands, manufacturers, and then specific subject matter experts to be able to evaluate all of these different solutions and where we need further expertise that is drawn on as well. So once the advisory council was formed, they worked together to create the vision for the climate solutions portfolio, what it was hoping to achieve, and importantly, then also the application process, which then uh, kind of helps answer those questions. And last year, that uh, the grant application process opened in February, it concluded in March, um, and then, uh, yeah, there was uh, quite a lot of time spent to really go into the detail of those applications, and through several kind of rounds uh, subsequent to the initial application, we were very uh, excited to announce the successful grantees in September of last year. And what I'm going to talk about today specifically is the roadmaps that we launched in the second half of last year. So the Climate Solutions Portfolio grant making happens twice a year. The first round will always be in Q1, um, and that is an open call based on our grant funding thesis. And then the second round of funding will always be a targeted call for proposals. So this year we had a targeted call for roadmaps on energy storage and low carbon thermal energy, which is going to be the focus of today's webinar. But towards the end of last year, all of the grant projects kicked off around October. And in December, we had the first kind of check in with our grantees because we don't just give them the money and say, uh, be on your way and, and uh, you know, deliver impact. We want to track that impact. We want to support the projects. We want to make sure that they really happen according to the projects that they've agreed to deliver with us. And very excitingly, um, this month, so the first month of the year, we have launched our grant funding thesis. So this just makes much more concrete exactly what it is the climate solutions portfolio is looking to do. And if you're keen to learn more about that, because I won't go into too much detail today, um, we are having separate webinars on that uh, as we kind of lead up to the application opening in March. So if you are interested, um, please do register for those webinars. There's one uh, next week on the 30th of January if you are EU or Europe or, or Asia based. Um, and then there will be another one on the 8th of February if you're coming from uh, a US time zone. So just to kind of introduce um, the, the grant funding thesis on who should um, apply to the climate solutions portfolio, we have narrowed down our thematic areas to really make sure that we're funding projects that are going to be delivering emissions reductions and are able to scale for 2030. So I won't go into too much detail. They're listed on the slide. You will see that next generation materials is not a part of that. And that is a conscious decision um, because those uh, that lever is very important, but it is not one that we feel our funding can impact because the level of funding it needed is, is quite a bit more. And it's unlikely to deliver scale by 2030 in the same way that some of the other levers are going to, like reducing process energy, um, uh, uh, switching energy sources. So those are our thematic areas. What's really required from a grant application or any solution applying to be on the registry is data. We need to see that the impact exists. We need to see where it comes from. Um, the solution should also have broad sectoral reach. So again, we're focusing on where we are going to get the largest impact. You might have a very impactful project that reduces emissions by 90% on one very specific material in a very specific process that accounts for less than 1% of the sector. If we compare that application against a uh, coal phase out program that addresses all of tier two, potentially, it's quite clear to see which of those solutions is going to have the broader sectoral reach and which one we're more likely to um, to 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 uh, provide grant funding through. So the uh, kind of applicability across the sector is really important to us as well. Then, of course, we need to see the demonstration of greenhouse gases reduction. So that's why we're really focusing more on the proven solutions rather than something in a concept or lab phase. And therefore, you know, also the ability to scale by 2030. And then maybe just uh, finally, before I go into the roadmaps to kind of distinguish between a grant funded solution and a registered solution, a grant funded solution is an application from a solution which might be a technology um, that needs support a program of implementation. Um, these are projects who uh, are able to 
still demonstrate emissions reduction, of course, and indeed a project itself has to reduce emissions. So the funding needs to be tied to a delivered impact at the end of the project. Um, but the funding has to be additional. So we want to fund projects that, you know, otherwise would have struggled to happen without our funding. They should result in alleviating some type of barrier to scale have longevity beyond the grant funding so we don't want the project to just stop we want that solution to continue delivering impact and it should deliver uh, a contribution to sectoral goals as well so what are we going to learn from this project that is going to help the sector achieve its 2030 goals and beyond so these are tend to be uh, kind of less mature solutions that need a bit of support to demonstrate their impact and move forward registered solutions that apply if they are already operating in the market at scale. So these could be very, um, you know, uh, very established technologies that many facilities already employ, but, you know, still should be employed further. Or they could be those that are slightly more innovative, but are already operating in, you know, several facilities and have demonstrated their impact. They have performance data to prove it but they don't need grant funding. They just want to deploy more and they could do that through our programs. So they should apply um, to be on the registry as well. So that was an overview of what the climate solutions portfolio is. Um, and now I'll go into detail on the industry roadmaps, which is our kind of, what was our second round of funding in 2023. So you might ask, why did we commission these roadmaps, especially in light of what I've just said, which is that we want to support grant projects that um, uh, kind of focus on implementation and reducing emissions. And these roadmaps, um, we felt are a precursor to being able to support projects in these areas. So in the first round of applications last year, we received quite a lot of projects that uh, covered energy storage or, or that tried to address the transition to low carbon thermal energy. And the advisory council felt that these projects were quite limited in scope and that they actually were not taking a very scientific or indeed context-based approach. And that um, yeah, gave the advisory council a bit of pause. They didn't want to fund these projects because they didn't think they were um, kind of informed enough, uh, the projects themselves. And then the advisory council went a step further and said, well, actually we are not informed enough on, on these topics. Of course, we all know that we have to transition to low carbon um, uh, more lower carbon th sources of thermal energy. And we know that energy storage as a concept is, is a good thing, but really how do we make decisions on these topics? And disparate reports exist. Uh, certainly lots of brands have targets in these areas, but there seem to be kind of a lack of, of an industry vision that is really taking a context and science-based and data-driven approach to decision-making. So that is really the intent behind commissioning these roadmaps is to develop an industry vision and knowledge base for everyone to use so that we can move forward on the very important and necessary transition to low carbon thermal energy. And so that we can also assess what the role of energy storage could play um, in, in our decarbonization transition. So that will be an industry uh, product. It is, it's going to be publicly available, but of course it's going to be very useful for our advisory council as well, because it will form the foundation of any decision-making we make on, on funding any projects in energy storage or, or low carbon thermal energy, or indeed any uh, kind of technologies that apply to be registered on the platform. And our aim is once we complete these roadmaps, that uh, the kind of second round of funding for this year will then be a targeted call for projects to implement off the back of these roadmaps. So that's where the emissions reduction and the real impact will come once we've established all of that knowledge. So we have two roadmaps that we've commissioned, and I just wanted to give a brief overview of what we are aiming to, to achieve with these. So for the first one, Energy storage is being employed in, in quite a lot of other sectors. Um, and we really wanted to see what the potential was for the textile and apparel sector. And specifically, we're looking at, you know, uh, on, a, on a country level and on a facility type level. 
in which cases would this, um, you know, perhaps further enable the deployment of renewable energy? And that could be particularly interesting in markets where, you know, you're not able to sell excess energy back to the grid, for example. And we're not just looking at electricity, we're also looking at thermal energy. So to what extent could storing excess thermal energy make for more efficient use of that energy? So this will really assess what the potential is for energy storage as a technology to reduce emissions and, and maybe even to, to facilitate further deployment of renewable energy solutions. Then the low carbon thermal energy roadmap is going to look at the different technologies that are available and what their enabling and constraining factors are. And that will really help us assess which technologies are most suitable for which contexts. And um, yeah, that is because we really felt that the, the facility level decision making and even you know brand level uh, kind of target setting on this topic really does need to be context specific. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a same kind of timeline for every facility or every country. This is all going to look quite different. And um, it's such an important part of, of the decarbonization of the sector that we want to make sure that we're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. So the aim is that um, once we have this roadmap, it can really start to accelerate the deployment of low carbon thermal energy because we then have the answers on, on how the best way is to move forward. So just a bit on who is delivering these roadmaps. So we um, put these out to tender and uh, a selection of organizations then sent us, um, you know, their uh, project designs and, and based on a number of factors, we, we chose these two parties. So we have the Carbon Trust, which is a UK headquartered, but international climate change consultancy that's doing the energy storage roadmap. They have a lot of experience of decarbonizing industry, looking at things from a systems level and really taking a data driven and scientific scientific approach and they've been doing that for, for over 20 years. And then for the low carbon thermal energy roadmap, we have global efficiency intelligence, which you may be familiar with because they have written some reports that already exist on different low carbon thermal technologies, but those reports are very country specific or technology specific. So they will use all of that experience they already to have to kind of synthesize it all at an industry level across lots more countries and more um, technologies. So we have a, uh, a kind of methodology that we've created for these roadmaps that both of them will follow. There will be slight differences because, of course, they're looking at different topics. But essentially, these are kind of the headline um, outputs of the work that you can expect. So there will be a technology evaluation table, which is a, an easy summary that, that can be used as a decision making instrument that will look at things like the technology readiness level um, and to what extent uh, a solution is ready to scale. When is it more likely to be uh, um, implementable? Importantly, we will also look at the cost of these different solutions. Um, an in-depth evaluation of CAPEX and OPEX needs will be done as that is a crucial deciding factor of whether or not a technology is viable. Um, but we, we really want to be able to assess, you know, what are the barriers to implementation, for example. So we will look at the financial technology, technological and also supply chain barriers, as well as any kind of political barriers. If there is, you know, certain policies or the way in which energy markets are regulated that are unfavorable, we want to identify that for the key technologies, as well, of course, as what the opportunities are. So what are the enabling factors for certain technologies? And this will then really take a country specific approach so that we we have that context um, context based assessment. Of course, there will be an energy supply study, um, as, as that is the key input to, to, to both of these uh, solutions. Um, and we also want to make some policy recommendations. So we'll be looking at some of the countries where perhaps these solutions are more applicable than others. And what is it actually about the policy and regulatory framework there that makes it so? And we're going to do that for the top 20 garment producing, uh, textile and garment producing countries. Then we are going to take a regionally specific approach, looking at kind of the, the largest exporting uh, countries and, and the, some of the highest emitters as well. And in order to take region specific insights, we're going to be using facility level data to really kind of mock up, you know, for a typical tier two facility in Vietnam, what would be the best 
um, solution for the transition to low carbon thermal energy. And we'll be able to kind of map uh, map that out. And, and that will be something that will be very useful for facilities themselves to use because we want it to yeah be representative and a facility could say, oh, you know, this analysis I can start with and, and start to evaluate for my own facility, which of these options would be the most suitable. And of course, uh, all of this will be assessed from an emissions perspective as well. So what is actually going to drive impact? And all of that will then feed into a roadmap where we can uh, give this vision for the sector across these different time horizons, um, what will be the best way to move forward for different technologies, different countries. And that will be the kind of work product. Um, and just a bit more to kind of synthesize that, what these uh, products will look like. So it's broadly split into three work packages. The first one is the more kind of general overview of the technologies, key enabling factors, and, and really an evaluation of, of the, the different contexts in which they would work. And that would be applicable to any country. So that's really just what makes this work and what does not. Work package two is when we then go into more detail and we focus on those um, countries that we're prioritizing, do the facility level study, and really give a very detailed picture of what will be the best way forward in those countries. And that detail will also then help us to make the roadmap for the sector. So what we've commissioned for now is work packages one, one and two, and they will be completed around uh, the end of the summer this year. And that will then form the basis of our request for projects, which will be work package three. Um, and that will be a targeted call where we you know, give some loose guardrails for what we want this project to look like. And we'll go out to the industry to kind of come back um, for, for solution providers to suggest some implementation projects off the back of it and our grant funding will then support the kind of project management uh, and, uh, and um, uh, yeah, development of these projects in order to start implementing some of these technologies. So that's an overview of the roadmaps and what we're trying to do with them. And we'll have more uh, in subsequent engagement days, I'm sure, to update on the progress of these projects. And as I mentioned, and, and really want to reiterate, these are industry pieces of knowledge. They are going to be publicly available once they're published. So they really are intended to be very action oriented um, and easily digestible by the brand facility and um, financial community audiences. So just to close off, um, I've spoken a bit about what you know our, our plans are for this year in terms of these roadmaps, um, but there are some other key dates I'd like to share. So as I mentioned, uh, coming up next, we have our grant funding thesis webinar. So for anyone looking to apply for a grant, um, we, we are giving some more detail on exactly what it is we are looking to fund and how. Um, in February, we will have some stakeholder engagement on the roadmaps, um, and in March, the uh, grant applications will open. And that's uh, a full month that applicants will have to fill out the application um, and, and the guidance uh, will be provided there as well. I mentioned earlier on in the presentation that the climate solutions portfolio is not just for grant, grant funded solutions, but also mature solutions. That side of things will launch um, in May because we are still kind of finalizing what, what that looks like, what the processes would be for integration into our program. So we'll be very excited to launch that in May, at which point the, there will be a continuously open application for any mature solutions who want to be registered on the climate solutions portfolio. We'll have some more stakeholder engagement on the roadmaps earlier on in the summer, and the kind of full roadmap will be um, published in July. Uh, in August, we'll have made the decision on the first round of funding. So that application that closes in March will take a few months to, to properly evaluate them and go through all the stages um, before the board signs off and we can announce who received the grants and the projects will then start as well. Um, and in September, we will have this targeted call for implementation projects off the back of the roadmap. So again, there will be a one month kind of application process for these very specific projects that we're looking for. And we anticipate that those projects will then be selected and announced and start in December. So yeah, that was uh, an overview of uh, one of the newest uh, kind of projects that we've commissioned from the Climate Solutions Portfolio. Um, and I'll leave it there uh, for some questions and answers if there are any. 
Thanks, Pauline, for those here. Um, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer feature of um, the Zoom platform here. Um, and we'll be happy to answer the questions here as they come in. So I will give it a minute for any possible questions, or um, I believe we also have the ability if somebody wanted to un raise their hand, we might unmute, but I think Q&A feature will be the best. Um, and as a couple come in here, I will give it just one second and then Pauline, I'll start um, reading them off for the group. So the, the first question we have here is, does roadmap deliverables one and two publications scheduled for March 29th and July correspond to work package one and two described on an earlier slide? So just a question, clarification, alignment of what are the work products and timing specifically? Yes, exactly. So that more kind of general view um, of the the technology assessment in, in kind of a, a generic sense of what are the enabling and constraining factors for each technology and a, a map of how that fits on to the top 20 textile and garment producing countries that will be published in uh, towards the end of March. And that will already be an actionable um, document for the sector. To, to kind of yeah uh, assess uh, some of the initial decision making or plans you might be making. And then the detailed roadmaps where we look at those specific countries, go into the deep dive, do the facility level assessment as kind of mock, um, you know, this is what implementation would look like for that type of facility that will be published indeed in July towards the end of the summer. I'll give it a little while or for some additional questions as we're reaching the end of content for today's session. Um, again, a few more minutes on questions and answers. And if none comes in, we can go ahead and end today's session. And again, as a reminder, um, a couple different um, housekeeping things. We will make these recordings available in um, some form in a public resource. Probably sharing them out via our monthly newsletter that we issue. Um, if you do want access to the newsletter or if you did not receive the invitation from us for the quarterly webinar days, please reach out to Bryant at apparelimpact.org or Pauline, Pauline at apparel or apparelimpact.org. And we're happy to ensure that you guys have access to all the materials. Um, another question for you, Pauline. We mentioned a separate plan for alternative materials um, in relation to some of the CSP work. Can you elaborate on what that is or what that might mean? So uh, it's it's not so much a separate plan as a kind of decision for us not to focus on that for now, um, because the kind of funding available for for the grant grants um, typically is, is not uh, kind of material for, for the level of kind of early stage development that those solutions are at. And because we're focusing on the 2030 uh, goal as a scale, so really in, we want the solutions that we're supporting supporting to be able to scale up very rapidly in the next few years and, and accelerate their deployment to in a very material way contribute to that 50% reduction by 2030, we've decided to not support uh, projects from a grant perspective or on the registry, because we also assume there won't be uh, many registrant applications that are mature enough in that thematic area. What we are supporting from a tier four perspective is the reduction in intensity of existing materials. So uh, projects that look at the agricultural practices associated with cotton cultivation, for example, to uh, make that uh, less emissions intensive, just as an example of, of projects that we are looking at tier four. Um, and in some instances, a circularity focused project that is maybe a little bit more along the way and, and kind of on its route to scale, we'd be very interested to support as well. So we're, it's not that we're ignoring the material side, it's that we're just focusing on the elements of it that we think are more likely to scale by 2030 because of their maturity today and where we think our funding um, can have uh, can have a better and a more remarkable impact. Thank you. Great. We will give it one more minute here um, for 
for any possible last questions. But again, if there's anything you think of after today's session, please feel free to reach out directly to us. We are happy to continue the engagement. Um, as I mentioned, um, this is the last of today's webinars. Tomorrow, um, global time, we also have another Climate Solutions Portfolio webinar demo days for those that are interested. Um, Thursday and Friday, we'll have regional sessions specific to those regional leads and activities happening in each region. And as Pauline mentioned, additional Climate Solutions Portfolio webinars on January 30th and February 8th, dependent upon global time zone. Um, and as we look out as well to quarter two, plan for additional engagement days in April, which we will announce in an upcoming monthly um, newsletter that we issue Jul July, I believe is quarter three in October, we'll round out to quarter four, where we'll have different themes and updates for each of these sessions, including some of our blended capital and additional work streams that AII is taking forward for the industry. Um, and so I don't see any additional questions. So with that, we will go ahead and conclude this webinar session. Thank you for everybody who's participated. I know it's late for some, it's midday for others, and we greatly appreciate your contributions and commitment to this time and being valued partners to the Apparel Impact Institute. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.